Good evening all and welcome. Tonight's video was actually decided by a poll on Patreon by my amazing patrons. Thank you so much guys. If you would like to receive tons of perks and special benefits, you can find the link in the description to Patreon. But for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This happened in 2008, when I was nine years old. I lived in a townhome community, where each road had two sides of homes. In between the backs of houses, there was a back road with alleyways that went in between each building section. I lived on the edge of one of these, and my townhome was on one of the alleyways. I lived on one street, and across the back road on the opposite side lived an elderly woman whose name I can't even remember. I'm not sure what her situation was, but for whatever reason she never liked me specifically. She was creepy and spray painted all of her windows so that no one could see in her house. However, that never stopped her from sometimes staring out of her bedroom window directly at mine and keeping it open at night to shine a red strobe light into my room across the way. She used to yell how she hated us. I was in the fourth grade, and on a particular January morning, I had unfortunately missed the bus. My dad sent me outside to get in the car so that he could drive me, and he said he'd follow me out soon after. As I was walking to my dad's car, she came out of the alleyway next to my house, slowly, with a gigantic kitchen knife behind her back. She raised it and began running after me. I was faster than her, so I was able to avoid her and was able to get into the house. She walked and stood on the neighbor's porch across the way and stared at my house. I was terrified. My dad ran and yelled at her and she said she wanted to get rid of us stupid kids. My parents called the police, but the police sent her home and had an ambulance pick her up later. My parents went to some kind of court meeting about it but I never really found out the details. But I didn't see her again after that, until one year later. It had snowed that morning, and I was gonna run out to the front door and play in the snow. That's when I opened the door and see her standing on the porch, but looking out towards the road. I panicked, closed, and locked the door. I ran up to my parents' room and told them what happened and we saw her walk off the porch up the street, and I never saw her again after that. My family has since moved far away from there, but people I know still say she lives there, and her windows are still the same spray-painted ones. Though it doesn't affect me as much as it used to, I still don't like being around knives. This happened to me when I was in third grade. My regular babysitter was ill, so my mum asked one of our neighbours, Brandy, who had kids and babysat a lot of the neighbours' kids, if she could watch my brother and I for a few hours. We were having so much fun at Brandy's house, when my mum came to pick us up, I asked if we could stay a little longer and finish Madagascar, as we'd just started. She said it was fine, but I was to walk straight home after, like maybe half a block. A block, so not far at all. As the movie finishes, Brandy said I need to get home fast because it was dark out. As I was walking home, this other neighbour, Dennis, is standing outside in his yard. I had seen Dennis about the neighbourhood because his wife was very unforgettable looking. They had a daughter and she was about four-ish and I didn't ever play with her or know her family outside of seeing them around the neighbourhood. Dennis starts calling to me. Hey, what are you doing? I'm going home to my parents. Do you want to come inside for a bit? No, I told my mum I'd come straight home. I'm sure she won't mind. No thanks. I have a daughter who would love to play with you. We can make snacks. At this point I was like, red flag, abort mission, and I start booking at home. Then he starts to follow me. Not quickly, just walking like Michael Myers. Luckily I made it home, and once he saw that I was approaching my house with my porch light lit, he backed off. I'd like to mention that behind our house was a giant wooded area with paths that led to the nearby lake. So this dude could have caught me and dragged me into the woods or something. I try not to think about what could have happened and what motives he had. Well, fast forward until I'm in high school working at a restaurant in town. 
and I see creepy Dennis and his wife all the time. Turns out there were secret shoppers in our restaurant, and I don't think he recognised me working, thankfully. Between the ages of four and twelve, I was friends with a boy called Jack. Jack was always a bit of a strange kid, but being my neighbour, he was my first friend in life. Me and Jack used to play out every day, whether it was football, going to the park, or even tag in the street with the other kids. You name it, we did it. One weekend it was summer, and when we were eight years of age, it was a scorching hot day, and two of the kids in our street were having a water fight. Having some water guns in our shed, I thought it would be a great idea to fill one up and join in. So as the day goes on and we're having a great time, and a few other kids had joined in with their water guns, this is when Jack comes out with one of those insulated flasks that keeps your water slash drinks warm all day and he hurls his flask, presumably he intended to throw the water, but it was full to the brim and it proved too heavy for him to keep hold of and the water and flask fell to the pavement, steam instantly rising just a few feet from me and the other one of the kids. Jack's mum came rushing out of her house and screaming at him to get inside, being only eight, I didn't realise how serious this was. A few years later, Jack and me went to our local park and when we got there, Jack asked me if I wanted to see something cool. He then pulled out a BB gun, a good one at that, and said he got it off his dad who said he could shoot cans with it. But when me and Jack went into the forest behind the park, Jack started firing at random kids also playing in there. I told him to stop a few times but he told me to stop being boring and continued with this stupid behaviour. I then made my way home where Jack would follow, shooting at me every so often, hitting me in the shins a few times. I told Jack to grow up, and told him I didn't want to hang around with him anymore in school or after school. I continued to see Jack in school, who would smile creepily at me, and would make slices across the throat with his fingers when he saw me. And one day, I was in my garden with my cousin, and Jack was in his bedroom window with a tie and made a noose gesture with it and pointed at me and my cousin before smiling sinisterly. Jack became very odd, and with our houses being attached and us unfortunately having the same back bedrooms, I would hear him hysterically laughing at night and would hear bangs on the walls at stupid hours. Shortly after I turned 11, Jack and his family moved away and life was peaceful. I continued to grow up and live out to my mid to late teens with great friends and Jack became a distant memory as I lived out my teens and moved away to university. I'm 22 now and when I visited home this past summer my parents informed me that Jack had been admitted to a mental institution after he had attempted to kill his parents and had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. This shocked me as I didn't quite know what to say but these events did come flashing back to me. My dad actually told me that the water fight incident was serious. Jack had attempted to throw boiling hot water at me and my friend that day, and we would have been seriously scolded had he succeeded. So Jack, I hope you get all the help you need in that mental institution, and hope we don't meet again. My neighbours in the crappy apartment I moved to after I moved out of my parents' place were hoarders to the extreme and alcoholics. We started getting roaches in our apartment about two months after they moved in. Then came the mice, then the rats. About a month after we moved in, we called 911 on them because we found one of them passed out in the parking lot or on the doorstep or the stairs. They came over and asked who kept dialing 911, and then they cussed us out because they didn't have insurance and had to take out numerous payday loans to cover the ambulance costs. We broke our lease and moved out after someone took a dump on our welcome mat. Talk about friendly neighbours. I consider most of 1996 to be a rebuilding year in my life. I was 25 years old, fresh out of a relationship that crashed and burned right before the wedding. So deep was the crater and widespread fallout that I had to move to a different state to avoid my to-be father-in-law's friends in law enforcement who were making sure I spent time roadside with them at least four times in the first two months after it all ended. I started over in a new place with a lack of resources and connections that were going to make it hard for me to get back into shape before I turned 30. Still, I was free 
and beholden to none but my creditors. So I had that going for me. I lived in my means and rented a townhouse in a long row of properties in a less than reputable part of town. I didn't have time to do a walkthrough before I moved in. In fact, I rented the place unseen, based on the online ad alone. It was close to the job, which was great because someone trashed my car the week before I moved out, and I ended up driving a beat-up Dodge pickup that I bought with the last of my savings. Once settled, I was locked into the rental for 12 months, which oddly enough gave me a sense of permanence in my new surroundings and helped me get to work on my new life and career in human capital management and training services. My unit was at the end of a block of 12 with two bedrooms up top with a master bath and half bath in the living area. It was not a massive space, but it felt empty for lack of any furniture. I slept on an inflatable mattress my first three months and used folding chairs and a card table to eat and watch television. The block was a place where people were either on their way up or back down. Young kids in their first home, recently divorced with kids, the downturn from society in one way or another. There were fights, domestic and otherwise throughout the night. Drunken parties and birthday galas took over the block on weekends, but nobody ever interacted with other families for some reason. No one knew anyone else's name or business. At least, that's what the cops told me the first time they stopped by to ask me if I'd heard or witnessed something going on on the block. My immediate neighbours were just weird, like a space monkey on your lawn, inviting you to an anal probe kind of weird. It was a circus of three, the short, wild-haired woman looking like an off-brand troll doll with big pink hair that defied logic and a malfunctioning soundtrack that only shrieked when provoked. The tall, thin man looked like an average, bald human might appear in an elongated funhouse mirror. I never knew how old they were, but they resembled old, well-worn furniture, like the contents of any elderly couple's storage locker, old and ready to be discarded. Troll doll lady and funhouse man were not fond of talking to neighbours or anyone. They were troubled people. Their fights would bleed through the shared walls and get louder when talking outside. They knocked my only hanging art from the wall when one threw the other against the other side. Funhouse man liked to take his morning coffee in the sunshine, standing behind the screen of his front door in tidy whities and an oversized flannel shirt. He was often the first person I'd encounter in the morning on my way to work, and he would stare off across the playground into the woods, as if in a trance long before I left the townhouse, and probably long after my truck took me away. The cops knew them by their real names. There had been a child living there, but he or she had been removed from the home. A frequent guest in their little David Lynch sitcom was a guy called Chuck. So named because Troll Lady would yell his name every 10 minutes any time he was in the house. Chuck was a long haul trucker who parked his sleeper rig across the street every few weeks. For some reason, he didn't shower inside, so Saturday morning he would often run the garden hose over the fenced-in area in the back to take a cold shower, which was a lovely sight for the first time, when I didn't know what was going on. He sometimes walked out back to take a long beer piss in the runoff drain. His aversion to indoor plumbing was never explained to me, but I am forever grateful I never walked back out to catch him pooping a squat in the tree line. For about six months, I tolerated the noise. Let the neighbours be the bad guys and call the police when the fights went on too loud for too long or when they got all drunk and played their 80s punk records through the night and engaged in songs of their people howling at the moon. I got to a point where I was making enough money to buy real furniture and rent a better place. But I still had a lease to honour, so I bought a sofa, a real bed and a desk set for an office. It was still a minimalist affair, but comfortable. The townhouse felt like my home for once, and suddenly the intrusions from the neighbours were twice as annoying. One night, troll doll lady got into a fight with a pizza delivery driver who knocked on her door by mistake, but wouldn't give her the pizza. 
I only know this because the pizza and its box hit my front window at different spots. This shrieking, pink-haired witch assaulted the driver, which led to a light show by the police. I was left to clean the pizza off the window and called the office to replace the window. They refused until the neighbours agreed to pay, so I enjoyed a cracked window for a month before the court accepted her guilty plea over property damage. Her arrest was around the same time that residents on our block and the next one over began reporting burglaries, and I was asked by police if I had any information or experienced anything odd. Other than the three geek circus next door, I told them I did not. Fortunately, my work and social life were on the rebound. I met a girl and we hit it off, though we stayed far from my house during the early part of our relationship, so I began spending more time away from home, though I would often come home late to the neighbours in a loud state of either bliss or rage. During the day, maintenance worked to replace the insulation and update the HVAC system along the attic spaces along the entire block. I didn't think much about it because the work was done while I was gone in the daytime and assumed the property managers would be coming into my place at some point to access my attic. Probably the last one as they started on the far end from mine. Quickly, I lost track of the project. But one night I came home and something felt a little off. The front door was locked, the windows intact, and the back door secured. However, it felt and even smelled a little off. Sometimes I could smell the tobacco and weed upstairs when it filtered up and over the attic space, but I was sure someone had been there. I cleared the house in a short, quiet march, as my dad and Maureen taught me, but found no one and nothing missing. My computers, two TVs, everything was intact, except... I went to grab a beer from the fridge to calm my nerves and found a six-pack missing. I was sure I had two scratch-batch stout packs from my last visit to Stewie's micro-brew. The loaf of bread seemed to be a little shorter than the morning before by several slices. I couldn't be sure, but I thought I might be missing some other items as well, but wasn't sure if that was just the growing anxiety over being robbed. I wondered if maintenance had been by to inspect the window or work in the attic and help themselves to snacks and drinks. It would explain the musty smell in my apartment, and given the people I knew who owned it and managed the property, it would not surprise me if a couple of their day labourers took a load off for a bit. The smell was most unpleasant upstairs, but in my office which was opposite the neighbour's wall, so it wasn't lingering dank. It was clearly gym funk. I immediately assumed labourer because it made the most sense, so I didn't report it to the police that night. The next morning, however, I discovered my medications missing from my cabinet. All of them. My Lexapro, my emergency anxiety medication, and my other bottles were gone. I checked the windows and doors again, now in a near panic, and called off work for the first time using a burglary as my excuse. I was the seventh house in my two townhouse blocks to be hit in the past two weeks. The fifth in my block, and one of the five without signs of forced entry. The police wouldn't tell me much about the other incidents, and didn't seem to believe that I locked my doors until I reminded them who I lived next to. By that point, I really didn't want to live in that place anymore. It no longer felt like home. I was sharing it with something and I felt like it lingered in the air around me. There was a feeling of dread, a sense of violation knowing there was someone out there who was inside your life without permission. Once removed, it feels like living in a home without walls, and there was a serial burglar in a neighborhood where the cops traditionally let it work out its own problems and carry away the remains. A week after the break-in, a few things happened to mess up my world further. First, Troll Doll Lady returned home, and because she was on house arrest, a welcome party brought out all the freaks on Friday night. Second, because I was a dumbass, I had to come home and pick up a few things I needed to spend the weekend with my new girlfriend. As she was already in the truck, and we were going to the highway and out of town, there was no other choice but to bring her home with me. The lot, 
including my spaces, were filled with what looked like gridlock in a demolition derby, so I had to park a good distance away. Third, she insisted on seeing the inside of my townhouse and taking a pee before hitting the road, so I had to introduce her to the freak show next door before even setting foot inside. On the way up the walk to the front door, we encountered the funhouse man in the open doorway, gatekeeper to the drunk dumbassery inside. He was wearing his morning apparel, briefs and a long shirt, except with a can of red dog instead of coffee in his hand. Funhouse man looked at us coming up the walk and spoke to me for the first time in seven months. You tap dead, I think he said, his wet mouth spitting the words and his dead eyes scoping my girl. I shifted to put myself between them on the walk as we closed in on the door and fished my keys out of my pants. Funhouse man panicked, letting out a squeal before diving inside and slamming the door. The party was silent instantly. My girl was unnerved by all of this and lost all of the thrill of being with me in that place, and I registered her immediate disapproval. She didn't even want to pee there. I remember making some excuse saying it's a temporary thing and the first step to living better. But it was the beginning of the end for us, like she caught me cheating with troll doll lady. I didn't realize the party had spilled out into the front lawn and in front of my townhouse until I opened the door to see Chuck, the trucker, standing under my porch lamp looking drunk, stupid and angry. He was joined by a few strangers who looked equal parts in the same condition and also like I had just fired the lot of them from the sideshow. I stopped inside the screen door trying to think of anything to say, clever or otherwise. Chuck, the trucker, started the conversation. You go at Kenny? What? I ask you if you went after Kenny in his own home. Nothing like that happened, but I knew immediately that my reality was not shared by those gathered in front of my own home. No, he said something. I got close to here, he squealed and then ran inside, end of story. I was okay at the end of the first two sentences, but my anger got the best of me by the start of the third, and it did little to calm the group, which had swollen to about a dozen people looking for blood or things to break. Chuck was not convinced by my answer and took a few steps forward to open my screen door. He put a hand on the knob and stopped. You step out here or I come in there. Go take a crap in a tree. You're not coming in here and I'm not bleeding over that weirdo friend of yours. You can go beat each other up like you normally do. The words stopped there because Chuck had punched a hole in my screen to get to my face. I fell back and accidentally tackled my now firmly ex-girlfriend. Fortunately, I didn't have much in the way of furniture to break on the way down. The only thing going for me at that moment was the miraculous arrival of the police, drawn by the parking fiasco and the noise. My face was broken, my newest ex had a bloody nose and sprained shoulder, and I was out a good $400 in deposit for a weekend that would never happen. In short order, a few important things occurred. Chuck went to jail and the charges against him would become the least of his problems. The party turned into a story time where partygoers spun their best yarn about how I insulted, assaulted, beat, or did sexual things to Kenny against his will, i.e. the funhouse man. I was questioned about the encounter by police and spent time with an EMT who I totally failed to impress enough to get her number. I was let go as several of the partygoers were arrested for either public drunkness, disorderly conduct, or outstanding warrants. I'm sure this warmed me to the neighbours and their friends. My weekend companion was rescued from it all by a friend who drove her out of my life forever. You would think eight things in short order would be enough. I had to continue living next to these screw-ups for at least a few more months, and I was going to spend those months terrified by what they might do to my property while I was working or if the burglars came back. However, I woke up the next morning to see the neighbours cleaning up the party. Glass and aluminium, plastic and cardboard boxes, two full-sized bins. Credit where it's due. They recycled. From my what-the-hell position in my bedroom window, I noticed two of the bottles stood out from the Keystone, Red Dog and Milwaukee labels. They were the scratch-batch labels from my six-pack. 
Now, there was a chance that they were bought to the party by a guest with better taste in beer than their friends, but that was a very big coincidence. My brain presented a question that I could not answer. Where is the attic access in the townhouse? I just assumed there was one somewhere, but never actually looked or came across it. How did maintenance get into it? While totally unrelated to the beer bottle on a conscious level, my paranoia and cynical nature collaborated on a series of connections as I looked around the house for a drop that I'd missed for months. My brain worked in its weird way to line up facts in such a way that would sound insane if I wrote it all out. I went upstairs. My office was where the funk smell had been most poignant. I looked up and around and decided to check the closet. I didn't check it before because there was nothing in it. On the carpet, I noticed a light dusting of drywall and paint flecks. I assumed it was from rubbing on the sliding door against the wall, but it concentrated at the side by the wall and not equally along the track. The closet only had hanging shelves on the interior side. Looking up, I expected to see an attic access port, but found a jagged square carved into the drywall ceiling. Maintenance was not exactly flip this shack quality, but I didn't think even they would have used a box cutter to carve a hole in my ceiling, and none of them were skinny enough to fit through that. Funhouse man was skinny enough to potentially weasel up and down. The scuff marks on the inside of the closet were pretty telling. It took a while for the police to make their way over in response to my non-emergency call, but it quickly gathered their interest when the first responding officer reported that everyone missed the first time they did a half-hour search of my home. Three unmarked cars arrived after the initial squad car. My neighbors were uncharacteristically quiet once the first cruiser rolled up around noon. I offered a folding ladder and the police looked up into the blisteringly hot attic. A hole had been cut through the insulation and a spot in the corner wide enough for a small or slender person to fit through. I was questioned again downstairs for about an hour before I heard more voices upstairs than I remember going up there. Before I could ask, a familiar face appeared at my door. My landlord, Ahmed, looked concerned and astonished, which was a new expression after the third after his, can I take your money, and general resting, get lost face. What happened? He asked. What's going on? Are you all right? He walked into my home without invitation and up to me on my sofa. I asked him if he was there to fix my cracked window. Everything else happened without my direct involvement. I remained a guest in my own home for most of the day as police took pictures and marked up and down my stairs. I learned that my assumption about the attic work was wrong that workers had access to specific units to get around the firewalls between them. In fact, there were holes in the firewall that allowed workers to enter the roof in one unit and run the entire length of the building. It was a measure that saved time and footsteps, but was a violation of several laws and codes, meaning that Ahmed's life was about to become much more complex and expensive. These gaps in the firewalls also allowed someone to drill a hole in their own ceiling and run the length of 11 other homes walking on the same boards laid by the property owners that muffled their presence. Every single unit in that block had a similar hole to the one in my ceiling. Furthermore, at one time, the building had been wired for cable through the roof and holes that had been cut to fish cable into the upstairs bedrooms had been plugged up years earlier during an upgrade. Some of those patches had been replaced with removable plugs, giving someone a clear view into various bedrooms in the attic. Police found a step stool with a rope tied to the top step. It was stashed in the corner of the roof over my next door neighbor's unit. But that's not the weirdest thing. Though all the evidence pointed to the main access point being the smaller bedroom in my neighbor's unit, the police did not arrest Funhouse Man or Troll Lady for the crime. Around three in the afternoon, police had recovered items stolen from other units along with various controlled substances. Troll Doll Lady was arrested for violating the terms of her bond. Funhouse Man was taken in for the drugs. And I was shocked to see a third person, not Chuck, 
walk out of the townhouse in cuffs. I'd never met him before. He was rail thin, thinner than funhouse man by half, an old man's face in a young man's body with scars and bruises all over his skin that I've only ever seen on corpses, white and waxy. He was naked except for soiled basketball shorts and he literally recoiled as if allergic to the outside air and the sun and had to be dragged shoeless into the cruiser. I don't know who that kid was, but I got the feeling that he never left the townhouse, ever. Maybe not even the attic. The thought that this skeletal creep was looking in on me and had access to my life makes me overly cautious these days. I have eyes everywhere in my home, and I took pains to inspect the smallest spaces in and around the property. I often wake up in the night, seeing that face peering at me through a window or from the darkness. It's been a long time, and everyone I mentioned in this story by name is dead. I don't know about the kid though, I never got a name, and I was unable to find him in any police records. Maybe he didn't really exist, maybe he didn't show up in any records, and is languishing in prison as a Jong Do, or maybe he's out there lurking in some upper level of an apartment building, or hiding inside the basements or walls. I've rarely ever felt truly home since then. Life can change in the blink of an eye, and you're not always prepared for it. I certainly wasn't. In the year 2000, I had been married to my husband about three years. We were having a pretty steady life. I had just left my job and was about to have a baby. After having the baby, we were overjoyed. We had just moved into a new house, and because of my husband's job, we were able to afford it, and were looking and hoping to get somewhere a bit bigger in the next few years. My baby was only about four weeks old, when out of nowhere tragedy struck, and my husband was hit by an idiot driver who was on the wrong side of the road and died in the collision. There was nothing I could have done. That week, I buried my husband, and my life was thrown into turmoil, not only because of the huge emotional shift that had to happen for me, but of course, the disappearance of the financial support that he provided. His job gave little in financial aid after his passing, and of course, without an income, I had to find work for myself. My job was very specialized and it was a bit hard to find a job with childcare needs at that time for me. So after a lot of juggling, I managed to sort out a steady income, but it wasn't as much as I had before. And when the lease ended, I unfortunately relinquished the house. That was the last time I ever saw my husband alive. It was a hard thing to do, but for the best, I suppose. My daughter and I initially moved back in with my parents, but they were a bit overbearing. So, after a while, I decided to find somewhere where we could both live together happily for the time being. My job wasn't in the greatest area, but deciding that proximity to the office was probably best, I took residence in one of the cheap houses available nearby. It was grotty to say the least absolutely minuscule, a very small living space, one bedroom and one bathroom, but it was enough for my tiny family. The loss of my husband and complete collapse of my life thus far was still taking a huge toll on my life and I wasn't myself, but I had to try and be strong for my baby girl. After I arrived at the new house and got settled in, I realized that my neighbors were never in, if I even had any. Next door was a house that looked like it hadn't been done up in at least 20 years. The grass was long on the front lawn, litter was thrown everywhere, and it looked like no one ever came in or out of that place. The windows were so dirty, even though the curtains were never drawn, you could never see inside and on the few times I arrived or was outside at night, I would never see any lights on or hear any noises from the house. I thought the house might have been abandoned or condemned, and never really thought much about it. 
In the weeks that followed the adjustment of my life, I started to get really uneasy feelings while being in my home. I told myself it was just the grief and that it would take a long time to heal. But then something happened that changed all that. One morning at around 6 a.m., I was having a shower. I tried to shower before my daughter woke up, and as I was showering, I swore I heard something on the ceiling. Instinctually, I look up, but as the shower was steamy, I didn't actually see anything. After I got back from work that day, I look around the bathroom and see nothing. I told myself it was just a house noise. One thing that is probably worth mentioning was that mine and the neighbor's house were connected by a shared wall. The bathroom happened to be on the shared wall we had. Another conclusion I got to was that it could have been from the neighbor's house, but as I said previously, as I'd never seen any form of human activity there, my instinct told me otherwise. So, I tried to forget about it. As the weeks went by, I found one of the strangest things I did find. It was a sliver of ceiling. It looked like it had been cut, and when I looked up after finding it on the floor, there was indeed a hole in the ceiling. If it had been cut, it had been done very badly and very roughly, but with an amorphous shape. I looked up and wondered how the hell it had fallen down. I tried to get the stepladder to put it back up, but wasn't tall enough to slot the piece back in. Frustrated, I didn't know what was going on and resolved to call the landlord the next day to try and get it sorted out. I left that patch of ceiling on the kitchen counter and forgot all about it for many months. My landlord was never called. I completely forgot about it. Then, weeks later, I find another sliver of ceiling, but this one in the bathroom. I was looking up at where the hole was and it was in between the shower and the toilet. This time it was starting to creep me out. If someone was in the ceiling, well, as unlikely as it was, they would be able to see me shower and do my business, which really freaked me out. It was a very tiny piece of ceiling though, and after finding the forgotten piece from the other room, I resolved to this time call the landlord. When I finally got around to calling the landlord, I asked him about this and if he could please fix it. He told me he would send someone round, but said that we shouldn't go up into the attic as that wasn't in the lease agreement. So, I left it at that. Days went by and after chasing him, he never sent anyone over to fix it. And I quickly forgot, dealing with lots of stuff at the time, so it wasn't at the forefront of my thoughts. Well, that of course all changed. A few weeks later, I was just about to take a shower and was sitting on the toilet when I hear movement from above and a tiny amount of dust falls from the ceiling. Instinctually, I look up and that's when I hear shuffling leaving my attic space and going towards the derelict neighbor's house next door. I cover myself and start shrieking. I was sure someone was spying down on me. This time, I call the police. After an interesting conversation between the landlord and the police, they manage to open the attic on my part of the house. It turns out that someone had been living in the derelict house that the landlord owned, but didn't actually rent out to anyone. It was a homeless man. He had been living there for who knows how long and had cut the holes in my ceiling and had been spying on me. I felt so violated. Someone had been spying on me while I was naked, while I was in the bathroom, and it repulsed me beyond words. I told the landlord that I wanted to move out, that this was unacceptable and it could have all been avoided if he could have just fixed the damn holes when I asked him to. The police didn't get involved at this point, but their presence being quite pronounced, I think that's why he relented and let us terminate the lease early. I ended up moving back with my parents' house 
and got an apology, my full deposit, and half a month's rent back as another form of apology. So that's something, I suppose. But it really destroyed my sense of trust. And honestly, I'm always checking for holes and look up at the ceiling whenever I enter a new space, check for double-sided mirrors in public bathrooms and the like, because you never know what kind of pervert could be watching you when you're trying to do your private business. It really shattered that for me. I just hope that it never happens to my daughter. When I first came to the look at the apartment I'm living at now, the people that were moving out were the ones to show the apartment to us. There was no one in the building present. They were a real scumbag looking pair. The guy just says out of the blue that he was going to prison and that his wife could not afford the place anymore. So I didn't think too much of it. And we move in a few weeks later. While talking to some of the neighbors, there are two townhouses and two buildings in the same development. They asked me if I knew what happened in my apartment. I was like, uh, no. Then they proceeded to tell me that the dude that lived there was off to prison for sexually assaulting a little girl in that apartment. Talk about information I didn't need to know. The worst part is that his wife got a new place on the first floor, right on the corner where all the kids would pass to take a shortcut to school. When this monster got out of jail, they let him move back in again. Who thought it would be a good idea to let a convicted paedophile moved into a secluded place that had tons of kids walking by all day. He did not last very long. Every time he managed to leave his home, he was yelled at, hissed at, chased and threatened. Still, that level of decision making is maybe the most disturbing in the whole story. I lived alone in a studio apartment on the sixth floor when I was in my early twenties. I had just gotten out of the shower when I heard a knock at the door. I answered it, chain on, and the guy said he was my neighbour. He looked harmless, so I removed the chain and asked what was up. Dumb, I know. It's not the dumbest thing I did in my twenties, unfortunately. He told me he was a neighbour from across the street, and that I should cover my window because he could see me shower and change. And I was like, uh, okay buddy, and before I close the door, I crap you not, he asked me out. After he left, I locked the door and called my boyfriend who bought me a bat that I still have kept in my apartment ever since. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's Neighbours. I certainly thought that they were rather creepy and would not like to live near any of those people. Actually, the neighbour on the left of me is moving out soon, so it's going to be interesting to see how the new neighbours are. That's going to be fun. The neighbours on the right are a bit loud, but generally harmless, so it's fine. How are your neighbours? That'll be an interesting conversation. Um, I hope you guys don't have any like these. If you would like to hear even more stories, you can follow the links at the end um, to watch more. And a huge thank you, as always, to my members and patrons for your contributions to keep the channel running. It means a hell of a lot to me, so thank you, guys. You mean the world. But for now... Stay awesome, click here for more, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.